Hey, Biology 11, Mr. B here. Well, I'm moving on to Phylum Mollusca. Uh, I've got a, it as item 11 uh, in our uh, e-learning site, the Moodle site. I need to really talk about uh, this phylum in particular because it's such a great invertebrate phylum to talk about. Remember that as far as animals on our planet go, animals on our planet go, 95% of the critters on our planet are invertebrates and that remaining 1 20th, you do the math, 5 out of the remaining 100, is composed of things with a, a rod up its back. But it's really the invertebrates, uh, now that we've studied the annelids and as we've moved forward into the mollusks, that had a lot of staying power um, over the eras and the eons. And they're really fun to talk about and my favorite, they tend to taste good. So let's get rocking and rolling. A few things to show you here with um, our lesson. Once you click on the lesson, you'll come here and um, I'm updating this. This will say that there will be a video here soon. These notes will be the student version. And there's some really awesome animations here talking about how filter feeding works with something like a clam, how jet propulsion works, these are previews unfortunately click down here on these little flash video things here which is what I originally intended this live preview is showing up and it's driving me crazy for your YouTube pleasure we have the one that you absolutely cannot miss uh, cephalopod amazing camouflage and defense if you've ever watched TED talks videos uh, there's a great lecture there where a, a fellow talks about how intelligently uh, when we look at things like octopi and squid, how they can not only camouflage themselves for the purpose of defense, but also for mating. You have to check that out. Watching a scallop swim for its life when a starfish comes nearby. Very cool. Giant squid dissection. Ooh, can't miss that. And probably my favorite animal ever uh, in, in all my studies. I don't know why I love it. Maybe it's because they're so colorful and poisonous. Um, nudibranchs. Neat little critters. Check out these videos. If there's a dead one, hey, let me know. But... We need to get going, so let's rock and roll. I think reflections on. Yeah, we're good to go. And we shall get going. So mollusca. If you like calamari, that's a mollusk. That's a squid. So let's go back to our little friend here. And since we're moving on to mollusks, let me see here. One quick sec. Actually, I have to turn this off for just one moment. Contrary to popular opinion, I don't always have the chapters memorized. Chapter 27. There we go. It's okay. Get to see that sometimes even we need to figure things out. 27.4. Ha! There we are. Good. All right. Branch fire, do your thing. All right, so the mollusks. Phylum mollusca, I mean, when I think of a mollusk, I think of something soft-bodied, right? Which would be a squid. Let's see if I can move that down. Darn things getting in my way. A squid or an octopus. Plural octopi. Cuttlefish. And those types of things. Now these guys don't have exoskeletons. We're not even at that point yet. When we move on to the arthropods, we're looking at things where a skeleton on the outside sort of becomes a possibility. Not so, not now. We've really only sort of stepped out of the soft-bodied annelids and moved into their more advanced evolutionary cousins, the mollusks. So in order to be a mollusk, what do you have to be? Well, here you go. I said it and I meant it. You have to be soft-bodied. And as far as a shell goes, um, you should look at something like a, a cuttlefish, for example. Um, let's, let's take a quick little tour here. If you look at a cuttlefish, um, you'll immediately recognize what we're talking about here. It looks kind of squid-like. It's kind of cute. They have a little internal shell, and we take that out of them and um, you'll see it being used 
uh, with parrots, for example, um, they use it to sharpen their beaks. Right? If we do a quick tour of the mollusks while we're here, let's just let's just meet a few. And a quick tour by Google will always do it. There we go. So, our friend the octopus. This guy is known as a nautilus. Um, and yes, they named Captain Nemo's submarine after that. Here you see the shell kind of external, interesting eye. You see the tentacles. Um, anytime you see this sort of head attached to these weird long arms, these feet, we call these the cephalopod mollusks. These guys are also mollusks. There's a, they're, they're bivalves, meaning they have two valves. So they have a soft body inside there. Again, another mollusk. This one, a snail, uh, obviously related to slugs, has an external shell. Yes, calcium carbonate. And we get wonderful shell arrangements. And the twisting of the shell, we call that torsion. Right? It's kind of an interesting concept. A few more things, mussels, limpets, oysters. Hey, let's meet all the mollusks. They're delicious. And a really neat picture here of just about everything you could see. The ones with the shells, the ones without the shells, um, octopi, nautilus. It just goes on and on. In fact, I'm a big fan of taking a quick tour through something like Google Images. It's neat on an iPad because I'm just sort of flipping through, checking them all out. And slugs are really just like these guys, sans or without the shell. Right? So let's pop back to our sort of word annotated tour of the mollusks. So we've met them snails and slugs, clams, mm, chowder, squid, octopi. You get the idea. Interestingly enough, mollusks, um, as they develop, when they're little, kind of in the baby stage, and you see this with annelids, they get this neat little worm-like larva, and it's it's segmented. It literally looks like a worm. Like a worm, but it's got these little fuzzies on it. Little ciliated bits, like this. I'm not drawing it perfectly, but I think you get the idea. These little tufts. And it's got an interesting larva. Now, this will come up a little bit later, but I feel like writing it in now. Which is very annelid-like. And I'll always tell you this. Pay attention to the development of the larval stage because it tells you a lot about what an organism may be related to. And a little like. Let's put the like in there. There we go. Neat. Of course, it has to be on the next slide. I think I liked mine a lot better, though. Um, this is just a smaller version of it. But there's your trochophore larva drawn all pretty, right? And this is something you see with annelids. So it's a, it very much makes them kind of look like a worm part of the time. And it suggests something evolutionary that they're probably kind of related. Check out that digestive system on the inside. It's kind of sneaky how they do that. There's the mouth right there. And kind of looks like the crop and the gizzard, right? Leading down that long intestine, which is really all that an earthworm kind of is. Giant intestine plowing its way through the ground. Food in, food out. But they differentiate. They don't stay like this. They become... Uh, as, as their DNA is fully expressed, you get the snails and the, and the bivalves and the cephalopods like the octopi. So what is it? There's four characteristics, and I wish, I really wish, that they'd just written them out. Here's what all mollusks have, okay? Put a star on this because it, it's always testable. One, they've got a foot. Now, by a foot, that may mean its arms. It's... it's basically what it uses for locomotion. Now I know we have feet and in an octopus it's pretty obvious the tentacles are kind of the foot and they're attached to the head almost directly that's why we call them cephalopods cephal means head it literally means head foot 
in these guys, there's a little, kind of if we broke them open a little bit, you would see that their body is kind of back there underneath. But then as it comes forward, there's this, you can almost, you can see the little muscular serrations on it. Their digestive system and more or less most of their bodies up here, but then you get this interesting little region right here that we call the foot. And they use it to dig into the down into the dirt and they can they can bury themselves deeper and deeper because what they want to do is sit underneath with their siphon sticking up like this and do some filter feeding. Right? Taking in stuff from the water column and pulling it in and then releasing waste products. So they will use that shovel like foot to to get down deep into the uh, down deep in well not too deep but just down in the sand it's also protective so they've got a foot it's used for locomotion it really is they've got something called a mantle and that's item number two that is a thin layer of cells that can make a shell it doesn't have to but it's i i tend to think think of superman's back right right about where his cape would be and if I guess not Superman, maybe more aptly Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or something. There's got to be a layer of cells that actually secretes the calcium carbonate to make the shell. And that's what I'm talking about with the mantle. We'll look at it in more detail. The shell may or may not be present, but it's important enough to make item number three. And the visceral mass, okay, when you hear the term visceral, you should think gut. That's what they're talking about, the gut mass. And if I switch pens for just one second, the visceral mass, let's choose a nice kind of uh, green, would be this, where you would find the stomach and the gonads and all that kind of stuff, right? And in something like an octopus, it would be up kind of in that large sort of pronounced kind of head region. So let's go back to precious blue, at least for now. So those are the four characteristics you'd need to know. And it's... Think of foot, mantle goes with shell, and then there's got to be a gut mass known as the visceral mass. Moving on. Okay, so you can pre predict how this is going to go. Um, the muscular foot, since they all have a foot, what does it look like? Well, in something like a snail, we call them the gastropods, because they, their stomach, their gastric region, right? their foot is down here. So they're crawling around on their bellies, Right? So we say these are the stomach foots. So this region here. I'll just highlight it. It's red, but you get the idea. And in a clam, you've got a foot here, right? Shaped kind of like the spade of a shovel. So they call that their foot. And over here, the foot. Now I, I, I you're probably saying, well, why are they including their eye and everything there? Okay, if it makes you feel any better really where are you there the foot region yes we are kind of talking about this right but it's attached right to the head so it's why we kind of call these guys the head foots or the cephalopods these guys over here are a little more boring we just call them bivalves we don't call them the shovel foots <laughs> it doesn't seem to work that way somebody thought that was boring right so they because they have two shells we call them the bivalves true story Okay, as we go through the course, I always expect you to think not only how are they defined, but what are their body systems? So feeding, let's be a little more obvious. Let's call this not just feeding, right? But let's think of it as their digestive abilities. Sort of uh, examining their digestive system. So what do we got? Well, we've got snails here doing a lot of damage to this leaf. So uh, herbivores, okay, we get it. You can also see that if a lot of snails, if they find um, a lot of aquatic snails, if they find a bivalve relative, they will, will literally, um, they've got this very interesting tongue. It's like a buzzsaw. They will lick that shell until they create a hole and they'll stick that tongue down in there, known as the radula, and they will just literally just lick up the bivalve. They'll just, they'll just eat it piece by piece by piece. And what we find is we find these shells of the bivalves with these holes bored in them and that's usually caused by these carnivorous snails 
uh, that will literally just buzz saw their way right through that shell. Um, filter feeders, a lot of our bivalves are just more or less holding up a tube and inhaling the, from the water column and they're filtering anything out of the water column that is of food value. Uh, detrivores, well, I kind of think of saprophytes. Detrivores, this is decaying material. So detrivores will pretty well eat any sort of like dead thing they come across. So it makes them kind of important. The term parasite, you know about herbivores and carnivores, right? They're off eating things, right? That's heterotrophy. Filter feeders, they're just capturing whatever they find. Um, mostly algae, if you think about what's coming into clams. When you open them up, they're almost all full of algae. So when you eat a clam, you have eaten not just their gut mass, not just their foot, but a whole bunch of highly nutritious algae. There you go. It's going to make it a little harder to eat clam chowder next time, isn't it? And then there's parasites, where in this case, um, you got to think about it. They are acting in a very parasitic way. Parasites don't necessarily kill their host. They'll just sit there and live off them. And these plants are being parasitized more or less by these snails. Sure, they're parasitizing a plant. To parasitize something means to, to injure it, to live off it, perhaps kill it, perhaps not, right? Like if you get worms in your body, right, you're being parasitized. Here's that um, radula I wanted to tell you about. Now, in this case, what we're looking at is that radula licking action. That's how a lot of snails will get the algae off the rocks. So this is an interesting little evolutionary feature to help them feed themselves. But if you look at that radula, it's a pretty impressive little piece of hardware. Um, it's got these little silica-like teeth. By silica, you know, I mean sand. So these little tiny teeth are attached to the radula. We get it. And sure, it's scraping algae, but boy, oh boy, it can also go after soft tissues and not just plants. So let's pop out for one second and let's look at a snail radula. And it, the radula, you can't just expect to find that more or less only in a snail. Um, if you look at some cephalopods, they have a poisonous radula and not just cephalopods, but Literally, it looks like a chainsaw, doesn't it? Wow. Lots of those little teeth. And if you look at an electron micrograph of it, you can see these little hard little flakes. Right? There's a tongue actually looked at a little more closely. Neat visualizations of it. It's quite a structure. So let's not look at just a snail radula. Let's look at the octopus radula. And you'll see another one, uh, snail radula. Well, actually here, ooh, I'm intrigued. Right there, see the holes, right? See how it's being there? It's being bored into. Um, not only that, but if you look at the beak of this, is really neat. Uh, you think beak, and you automatically think, well, maybe that's kind of reptilian. But the beak concept goes back to mollusks, and it. Obviously, you bite your prey, you rip into your, play, your prey. You've got this jabbing radula. And you, what you may also have is a uh, poison gland attached to that tongue. So you can poison your prey, then start ripping them apart with the beak, and then start ripping them apart with your radula. I mean, that is one nasty piece of hardware right there, right? Sort of starting to get the idea what that looks like. It's not just a bird innovation. We could say octopi and things like squid were doing this way earlier. Good. Now that I got that off my chest. The filter feeding sort of action. Um, if you get a gooey duck clam, let's, oh, I can't stand it. I got to show you a gooey duck clam. They have huge gooey duck. There we go. Gooey duck clam. There it is. Monstrous, monstrous sized. Um, siphons sticking out the side. So there's the clam and they've got these giant siphons and they're you know filter feeding the water column and you can think about it they're they are cleaning up the environment quite well. Not only that you have to understand 
if they go to reproduce, they will expel um, reproductive cells like sperm. They'll send that out and the females will inhale it and use it to um, fertilize their eggs. So gooey duck clam are just positively amazing. There's some crazy guy dressed up like a clam. But I guess you get the idea here. And there they are doing their thing live. Now that brings us back to the siphon. And you do need to know the difference between the two um, the two currents. Let's choose orange. So you get an inhalation here. I think I'm going to switch up colors. Let's go with black. You get inhalation here. And really what happens is it's passed over these gills. Now these gills have sweeping cilia on them. And they move. And you, this is cut away. But what really happens is they move the algae, things like that, closer over to the mouth. And these little palps bring the food in. And then you can see where it goes like that. So when we study these in the lab, you have to look at the gills and see that they're not just for respiration or for carbon dioxide oxygen exchange. They're sweeping food over towards the mouth and in it goes. In case you were wondering, by the way, these are muscles. These are the adductor muscles and they're what holds the lid closed on the clams so that they don't get eaten or consumed. The excurrent siphon sends away waste. Um, you can also send reproductive cells like sperm out of there. Right? Um, yeah, excurrent siphon. Uh, off goes the carbon dioxide, the used up water. I think you get the plan. Respiration? Well, I already referred to it, didn't I? They breathe uh, using these structures here, the gills. And it's kind of silly because of this cutaway portion, but your gills are kind of in pairs and you can pull them apart and you can see there's lots of surface area on the gills and it's just basically simple. O2 in and CO2 out, just like in us. Happens inside the mantle cavity. Now, this is going to sound a little bit weird, but in us... Let's switch colors so this is a little bit more obvious. Red. If you look at our blood, it's always traveling in a vessel. I mean, it starts in a blood vessel and it ends in a blood vessel. In these guys, it's not so. Sometimes the blood is literally pumped out of a vessel, so it sort of reaches the end of the vessel, like this, and it's sprayed over the organs, and then the blood pools back in to a sinus, I guess you can almost think of that as a drain, to then make a trip back to the heart. The heart is, is busy pumping blood through the blood vessels, and that blood's going by the gills, and it's picking up, it's obviously picking up um, oxygen, exchanging carbon dioxide, but then there's this weird spraying of the blood, like this, over the internal organs, and subsequent recollection of the blood to send it back for renewal. So what we call that, when you get this sort of interesting system, what we call that is an open circulatory system. There are times when it's open and the blood doesn't always pass through closed blood vessels. Now we say this is a very simple heart. All this thing really does is receive, pump, and just keep the blood circulating around. It's not like us where we've got this fancy uh, double pump system. One half of our heart is sending blood to the lungs and the other half is sending it out to the rest of the systemic side of the body. And or uh, this is, I mean, really, this is ridiculously simple. Um, not a, a, an evolutionarily designed pump for land use. We need, a, we need an amazing heart because we have a lot of demands, physiological demands by being on land. Just try going for a run and realize just how amazing our hearts need to be or birds soaring through the air they have to have excellent circulatory systems these guys they don't do a lot of moving so spraying the blood over the organs and getting all that all the nutrition that's in the blood on exchanged with the tissues that works pretty well ooh nephridia all right what does that mean well the nephridia that you know 
is in your kidney tissue. So when I say nephridia, you think kidney tissue. In us, we're fairly advanced. We put all of our kidney tissue together and made a couple little organs at the base of our back, like that. In this case, these guys didn't do that. If you went around searching for their kidneys, really what we're looking at here is we're looking at, and they're not saying this, but um, what kind of, what's kidney tissue for, right? It's for your excretory system. So let's write that in. Excrete or re, there we go, system. Come on, work with me here. And our excretory system has to get certain things out of our blood. If you've, uh, if you've ever known anybody that's had uh, problems with their kidneys, they have to go on low protein diets because a lot of protein, once it's broken down in the body, forms this substance known as ammonia. Now, ammonia is a very strong base, NH4+. And think about strong bases you know like, oh, I don't know, bleach. Now, if you suspected that you had bleach floating around in your blood, you might run to the doctor and say, oh, oh my God, you got to get this out of my blood. Ah, and your doctor would say, don't worry about it, your kidneys are doing it. Oh, good, I feel a lot better. And then you basically pee it out. Basically, oh, there's a hidden joke there. There has to be some kind of an organ, something in your body responsible for getting that toxic material that base out of your blood and it is da, 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 your nephridial tissue now as critters on the planet evolve this nephridial tissue starts to become a little bit more well placed as i said for us we get two kidneys in a fish it's that uh, purple stuff going up the backbone you probably never knew that but when you uh, clean a fish and you run your thumbnail up the backbone or you get dad to do it He's literally um, evacuating the kidney of the organism. True dad, true story. All right, well, we practically have already talked about this, haven't we? We've, if we're going to talk about the groupings, like as biological librarians, we say, hey, no problem. We've got the stomach foots. Can I marry you? Haha. Gastro, meaning stomach foots. And then we've got the bivalves, okay, so clams, we don't even have to stop. Clams, oysters, mussels, you get the idea. Anything crawling around on its foot, like a snail, qualifies as a gastropod. Gastropoda, two valves, head, foots. These guys, since I have more room. Okay, so octopi. Should we throw the kraken in here? Because it would be, right? Octopi and calamari. By the way, what's calamari? Quick quiz. Can you think of it? Mmm. Squid. Yes, it's squid. And I saw on CNN there a few weeks back that they had spotted a giant squid cruising around, actually live. We always seem to capture them when they're dead. But it's nice to see one that was alive. So Discovery, um, the Discovery Channel has a neat bit on that. You should check it out. Just Google Discovery Channel, giant squid, you'll be there. So the gastropods, bit of information. I think we know this about them already. Gastropods, like snails, can... Uh, they don't have to have shells. I don't get caught up on shells. But um, it's just a single shell. It's not like they have two. They're not a bivalve. And the they because they cruise around on their stomachs, we say that's their ventral side. And yeah, that's it's a form of protection that they'll use. They don't have to. It's neat when it twists. Um, that's not really covered in the book, but the twisting of the shell, this kind of pattern, where you get the really neat kind of you know, conch, right? That is called torsion. And believe it or not, 
there's a mathematical pattern behind that. Mathematicians, if you've ever heard of a Fibonacci sequence, that's what governs how that thing um, basically twists. We won't do that here. I'll leave that for Mr. Karangi or somebody like that. So here's some representative members of gastropoda. Snails, slugs, um, sea hares, sea butterflies. I should show you what a, a sea hare or a sea butterfly look like because they're not exactly showing them. So, uh, sea hare. Let's go with images. There we go. Just kind of these interesting snails. Um, in fact, at the start of our um, presentation, you saw this guy. They're kind of snail-like. Pretty neat as they cruise around. Right? Looking like that. And um, sea butterfly. There we go. Let's see a lot of these guys, but they're pretty neat looking. See butterflies cruising around, soft bodied critters. You don't see a lot of them, but they certainly are attractive. Oh, and we missed one nudibranchs. How could I miss my favorite? They call nudibranchs, uh, brank means gill, and nude literally means nude. These guys are very poisonous. They, they'll, they have their gills on the outside of their body, and they're not even afraid that something might digest or try to chew the gills off because they're so poisonous. In nature, I'm colorful generally means I'm poisonous. So nibble at your own peril. So these are nudibranchs and they swim with these flutters. They're really cool looking. Um, that's why they're my favorite animal. They're just amazing looking the way they flutter in the water. Now yeah, there you go. That's colorful. And color is a great way to say stay away from me. Uh, poisonous or you can fake it and be really colorful and not be poisonous. But that's a story for another day. Our bivalves. Moving on. Um, they've got powerful muscles that hold them closed. It turns out that if a starfish really wants to eat a bivalve, that what it does is, I'll just draw on the adductor muscles, it pulls this way and this way slowly but steadily just sort of suction cups on the outside and it just keeps pulling until those adductor muscles right here am there's one there and there's one there those adductor muscles will get so tired that really it's just like oh fine finally the, sh the shell just starts to open up and then the the starfish can get in there and literally just digest it right in the right in the half shell so mussels, oysters, scallops, and the damage done by starfish, you think about it economically is high because we sell these guys for a fairly good price. And well, starfish are busy eating our lunch, aren't they? Well, I guess you could say we're eating theirs. Cephalopods, headfoots. All right. Now, really attractive. You've got to go to the course site and watch that TED video on amazing cephalopod camouflage because what you have to understand is that these guys can control their color even relative to the left and right side. They can have a um, cuttlefish, for example, uh, will use sort of aggressive colors to ward off males while they're mating and they'll use non-aggressive colors to make the uh, female think that they're interested in them and they can do this simultaneously warding off uh, suitors while um, basically trying to attract a mate octopi can do this they can change color and once we studied it we found what we found out what they're doing is they've got a lot of color built into their bodies and that they're using muscular contractions to hide or expose certain colors when they want to appear angry so if they want to appear red, they'll move the muscles in their bodily tissues in a way where you see all the red coloration. And then later on when they're happy, they'll relax those muscles and those, those red pigments will sort of be hidden from the world. So they're using a really neat technique to control their colors. But they can do these amazing color patterns. They can make them look like waves, almost sort of hypnotic. 
you have to go to the TED video, okay? Because I'm out of material. I've hit the very end of the section. Now you go off and check out some really cool stuff. So I'm going to pop out of this for one second, kind of go back to the course site, turn off my reflection. There we go. All right, put my iPad down. I switch up here. Okay, so what we've got is um, neat stuff here. So watching the um, filter feeding happen, uh, kind of neat. Uh, don't uh, start the animation now. That's what we wanted. So neat little filter feeding action, and you can see how uh, this works uh, with um, a bivalve. So investigate this a little bit more heavily. You can see the food particles and the water particles. And there's a lot more here than I would test you on. I just want you to see it in general. Very cool. Coming down a little bit further. Oh, great brain pop video there. Meet the invertebrates. Link to their site. Uh, flash video. What do we got? Yeah. Um, squid. Oh, yes. Water flow and a squid. How they use their siphon. So their gills internal right here and we'll dissect a squid but if you watch the water it comes in here and then they use this sort of jet propulsion out here you gotta realize this isn't just jet propulsion they're sending their poop out here um, carbon dioxide waste products they'll send ink from their ink sac out of here but it starts by bringing in the water here sort of a neat kind of well inhalation and then passing everything over here and exhalation they can also send their sex cells out here. So if you've been paying attention and you look at um, what we had seen with the with the uh, clam. Oh, let's go back to the side view. I like this a little bit better. This kind of looks like the in-current and ex-current siphon. Just adapt it a little bit for a cephalopod. Well, heck yeah. That really is what it is. Mother Nature innovates and um, new structures and new purposes arise. So very cool. So as I say, go through those and you have to check these out. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm at 14% battery power, so I better tap out here. Um, I have to go on battery power. I don't know if you really care, but if I plug in, there's this weird hum in my video. But if I just run on battery power, no hum. So I can do about two videos at a shot. So ladies and gentlemen, that's it. In the meantime and in between time, We'll see you for another edition of Screencast Videos. Hasta luego.